welcome to another chance to get together and uh, just praise and worship our Lord. I was just thinking this morning, there seems to be a lot on this week, but nothing stood out to me. Maybe they're all highlights. I wonder what highlights you had. Uh, just seeing Jim, he reminds me, one of the highlights was uh, a trip up to Bilpin to uh, Joy and Jessica's cafe thing there for a, just a few of us celebrated a birthday. It was a great time together, I think. Joe and Jessica love seeing us up there. Just love seeing the people from this church. I hope you enjoy seeing each other together. It's uh, part of being a church is that we can encourage each other and uh, just learn from each other. So I trust this morning as we uh, sing together, as we listen to Stephen, and as we have a couple later on that uh, you'll be looking to encourage others and that you'll be looking to learn from God's word this morning. Let's just pray. Our loving Father, we're so grateful that we can worship you freely in this country. And thank you, Lord, that we have your spirit to guide us and lead us through our lives. We just pray, Lord, this morning that your spirit might speak to us through the words of the songs and through what Stephen has to say. Lord, that we might learn a bit more about you, that we might grow closer to you. And Lord, also that we might encourage each other in our faith. So I just ask this of you this morning, in Jesus' name, Amen. <coughs> well, this morning the uh, it's Communion Sunday again, and uh, the songs are particularly about Jesus, so you might or might not notice that theme coming through. But the first one, Believe I Am, uh, please stand with us and sing. Thank you. 
Let us give thanks for the offering. Heavenly Father, we do stand in awe of you. You're a God that loves us so much. 
And yet at times with some of the things we do, we just don't quite get that. And yet, Lord, you love us and want us for your own. And we pray, Lord, this day as we bring tithes and offerings to you that you have given to us, we give back some of what you've given to us. And we worship you. And we pray that these gifts, tithes, offerings would be used to further your kingdom both here in the Hawkesbury and through Carajong and throughout the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. We're going to uh, read together our passage for this morning. Whoops. Jump there. And uh, curious... As we look, and, and I'm going to look at growing up, I guess the, yep, I've got it there, shape up. So this new series is about growing in maturity, but not just what we ought to be, like some steps, some tools, some habits, see that series, spiritual formation. How do you physically, spiritually, emotionally grow healthy in who God has called you to be? So shape up is this series, and it's a series of tools and things or disciplines you're not, I know you don't like that word, but disciplines that actually help shape us. So as we look at, uh, let me go to the Bible reading again, sorry, there. We're going to look at Matthew 6, 1 to 8, and then next, next week we'll continue there. So we're going to read together if you'd like to join with me. And if you've got a Bible, that's great, follow yours, or it doesn't matter if it's uh, King James or a different version, sounds great. Uh, but let's read together and try and engage in what God's saying. So let's read So chapter one, uh, 6, verse 1. So be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honoured by others, truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. And when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Uh, and I'm going to go, well, we don't need that. We'll leave it here. Uh, Ellie's going to bring a song for us. And part of what we're going to be looking at is, um, over these next few weeks is developing the gifts and the ministries that God's given us and uh, putting them together in such a way that they bless others. Uh, that gives, and uh, Ellie's got a, a gift that she'll bring to us, so thanks, Ellie. Um, okay, so a few of you have heard talk about an artist called Lauren Daigle, and you said that you loved her worship music, so yeah, I chose one of her songs for today. So this is called Come Alive. There's so much we have lost As we look down the road Where all the prodigals have walked One by one the enemy Has whispered lies and led them off as slaves But we know you are God Yours is the victory we know there is more to come that we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we step into the valley unafraid. Hey. As we call out 
to dry bones come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts come alive, come alive. The fire of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones come alive. God of endless mercy, God of unrelenting love, rescue every daughter, bring us back the wayward sons, and by your spirit breathe upon them, show the world that you alone can save, you alone can save, as we call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. Up out of the ashes, let us see an army rise. We call out to dry bones, come alive. So breathe the breath of God, now breathe the breath of God. Breathe the breath of God, now breathe. Oh, breathe. The breath of God, breathe the breath of God, breathe the breath of God, now breathe. As we call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. Up out of the ashes, let us see an army. We call out to dry bones, come alive. Oh, we call out to dry bones, come alive. We call out to dry bones, come alive. Well, let's pray. Father, as we just consider your heart and as we look at your words and even as the song says our ministry is to actually speak your voice as you want to give life and as Jesus said life to the full you want us as your people to bless the same way that you bless to minister according to your heart and that your the power of your Holy Spirit through the gospel which is the words of eternal life, the words that reveal your heart. We want not only us, but others to know your grace. So Lord, as we look to your words, help not only me to speak clearly, but we pray, heart, that Lord, that your heart will be revealed, that our minds, our wills will be shaped to reflect your love. So help me speak clearly, help us to hear your words, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first part, and, and there's two parts to the reading that we've got. And I was looking back over my notes, and I have never in seven years preached on giving at all. Never. Uh, and I was trying to reflect, and I went through, not that I keep extensive sermon notes, but I went back through uh, a lot of my old sermon notes that I could find that aren't waterlogged from being in the garage and flooded, and my little... Uh, manila folder out of my filing cabinet that says giving has one page in it <laughs> which is curious because the heart of God is to give there's a prayer or when Jesus is encouraging us to pray he said why don't you ask your heavenly father because your father is more willing to give than you are to ask just think about that for a moment that God's very nature. Or there's another time when Jesus is teaching and he says this. He says, which of you, fathers, if your child asks you for a loaf of bread, will give them a serpent? Like you who are, and he literally, by way of comparison, says, you who are evil, talking about, and look, as a dad, look, I try and be good, but I know there's little bits in me that are not great. So he compares, he goes, if you... And comparatively, like, you know, on the bottom end of the scale, compared to God whose heart is just pure generosity and love, 
wants to, if you would give good things, how much more does your father want to give? So it's probably a bit of to my shame that I haven't spoken more about giving. And as a spiritual discipline, if we're going to shape up, and you've missed part because this comes straight out of the fact that God, Easter, brings us to life. So the song, we call out that God breathed, God put new life into us, and it is the very life of Jesus. And so in and through Easter... And then last week as we celebrated softly for us as a church, but celebrated Pentecost when God pours out or fills us with his Holy Spirit. Now you've got to take into mind God's Spirit carries the character and the nature of God in all of his fullness. And so now shaping up as or growing into maturity, reflecting that which God has given to us in and through his Spirit, And the simple steps were like, if you call out to God, save me. And remember Easter, not just the man in the middle, but the man on the side that said, will you remember me? Now the heart of God in his generosity to give away eternity was simple that Jesus said yes. Did you note that? Will you remember me? Yes, today you will be with me in paradise. I can't even see repenting there, even though we are called to repent. Repent means to say, I'm living in a way that is not only dangerous to my soul and destructive to others, but is walking away from you, God. And so repenting is, I'm going to come to you, God. I'm going to bow my knee. I'm going to give up fighting you, God, and come to you. So yes, we're called to repent, but then go back to that cross on the side of Jesus Will you remember me? And Jesus said, yes. Let me put that in the context of the prayer, the way that Jesus says, ask your father. Ask your father. What will God's heart be towards our prayer when we ask? He wants to give good things. And so just shaping that, obviously God has a plan and a purpose that's for our good to bless us, to minister to us. And so everything that he gives to us will actually guide us towards his plan and his purpose, which is for us to grow and to become those that reflect the character of he who is with us, God's Holy Spirit. So you need to understand the foundation before we start about giving because the foundation is that God gives. Now, in this passage, and I'll step back so... I can follow my own notes. I'm talking about, and I'm just going to flick through this because throughout this next few weeks, I'll, I'm talking about growing up to maturity. Knowledge is the beginning. So how can you know if no one's told you? So knowledge is the beginning. But the next part in, in growing is wisdom. Like wisdom is the putting the legs on or faith. Listening to what God says and working with God or obeying God. Remember the old hymn for those who are older, those who are younger, you might have heard it. Trust and obey for there is no other way to be happy. And that's actually a strategic word. Happy or content or full in Jesus but to trust and obey. That's wisdom. Knowing how to obey. But more than that, then God wants to shape our character. In other words, the truth of who we are in our innermost being. The truth. You're going to see a few words when we look through uh, Matthew here. And he says, your father who sees. God sees everything. And what I find beautiful is that in God seeing and knowing the truth of not only my but our character does not recoil or pull away from us. In fact, quite the opposite, will chase down. And there's a beautiful uh, little verse in Romans, and it fits in with repentance. It is the kindness or the goodness of God that causes us to repent. You know, that calls us up or reflecting a father's heart will discipline his child. This is about character. We don't want to just be happy, 
but we actually want to, in reality, reflect the heart and the character. So maturity is learning in knowledge and growing in wisdom and then sort of imaging, as it were, the heart of God in your innermost being or in the depth of your character. And then moving through that skill or your ability to then shine in the way. So God has given us gifts. We'll look at that a little bit in a second. But if God has his very presence, and in the Bible, there is two times when they talk about spiritual gift. Only two. Whenever they put spiritual and gift together, it's singular, and that's God's Holy Spirit. The gift that God has given is his spirit, who will then grace himself. Grace is important who will work out of us. So if you say, Father, forgive me, I've sinned, I want to follow you. Will you forgive me? Will you make me your child? He says, yes. And the Bible says, if you do come to Jesus as Lord, like you see or you recognize that Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin, and you go, wow, I'm incredibly humbled and I do bow my knee. I want to follow you, Jesus. You are Lord then he will actually fill you or give you that gift singular, his Holy Spirit, who will then grace through all of us, will flow out of us. So maturity is letting God flow out of you or skill, you know, the ability for those gifts to shine, those things. And the last part of maturity is maintaining that will or that drive, as the Bible says or Paul says, Christ's love His mission, his heart, his compassion drives us. It makes us so uncomfortable that we can't sit still. So how do we stay moving? How do we stay active? How do we stay, you know, walking in, as it were, or keeping in step with God's Holy Spirit? This is about maturity and and how we minister one to another to not only motivate but to remind and help with God's Spirit to compel us. So this is what we're aiming for, maturity. That's a summary of the last few weeks, Colossians. Be careful now. I want you to notice this. When you practice, that means when you do. See, practice is not when I, you know, like just try, but it's when I actually step out and do your righteousness. Now, this righteousness is interchangeable in the sense of God clothes us or gifts us with his Holy Spirit and part of God's character and part of the beauty of God, his righteousness, clothes us. It's draped all over us. But now the practice or the outworking of that righteousness, the doing of righteous things... So see when he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. So God is now going to talk about our motivation for our ministries. Our motivation for our ministries. Now, motivation is a really curious thing. Because my heart does like a bit of a trumpet. And now, now and then when someone says, oh, Stephen's one, I'll go, oh, stop it, stop it. No, please keep going, stop it, stop it. Oh, no, you know, there is something that builds up at us that, you know, we like being praised. We like when people says, but, and that's okay to like that. Okay, there's a little bit of healthy pride, but this is about your self-motivation. If my desire is for accolades, he's saying, be careful. And why? Okay, if you do, You will have no reward from your Father in heaven. But let me just jump forward. See, and then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what we're actually looking at is that God actually promises. Now this is sometimes seems not very Christian. And I'm talking about motivation. God says, I will reward you for all the things that you do in my name. I will reward you. In fact, that word reward comes up six times in these few verses. So your motivation, is it from the reward of people, which is okay, or is there something even greater? God's reward. Do you realise when we talk about God giving or blessing, he actually wants to reward. And he uses reward in, in a way almost secretly because often you don't see your rewards. So he's not putting it as a motivation, you do this and I'll do this. 
And sometimes if we are talking about, uh, you know, money and giving, the prosperity, the ones that say, if you give like this, then God will give to you like this. The distortion is they're actually trying to get the motivation to be, if you do this, you'll get this. But forget what your measure of reward is. I want to ask this question. What is God's reward? If it's better than people's reward, and I like people's reward, you know, we do it all the time with our children. We reward them for things that they do that are good. We want to bless them. But what's God's reward? How is, if it's so much greater, you know, you as a father would give a loaf of bread, how much more would your father in heaven give? What are the rewards? And let me just suggest that when you start to tweak to those, it actually fills you with an excitement and a motivation that far outweighs a bit of praise or a chocolate. Far outweighs. Now, I was graced to have a mum, a real mum. I've had three of them, but I've, my real one that brought me up. An older lady grew up in the Depression. Dirt, and when I say dirt, I mean dirt poor. I've told you before, 12 kids, number one and number three, this is heartbreaking, starved to death. Dirt poor. Let me just illustrate her. After birthing 12, losing two, adopts one, and then fosters nine. Where on earth did the money come from? Let's come back to it in a minute. But I used to see her sit at the head of her table and she often would say, my reward is in heaven, another jewel in my crown. And humanly speaking, I'd go like, what? It sounds a bit like pie in the sky when you die. You know that saying? You know, all this faith stuff and you wait until you get up there. Except having now just struck a bit over 60 and some of you a bit further than that, you start to go, well, hang on, life is short. How long is the wait? And then I look and say, treasure in heaven, God has this reward, not just there but here as well, but this reward, what is she looking forward to? Where is her joy when she would give up the, the food of her plate? Now look at what it says here. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen. If you do, you will have no reward in your heaven. So we're talking about reward. Let me jump forward to a few little bits I've got here. Giving... Or let me change the word blessing is literally a manifestation of God's Holy Spirit within us. I'm talking about Christians. In other words, I'm addressing not just generosity with a little g, but I'm starting to talk about something that is supernatural. As a hint, when Jesus gave bread and fish to those 5,000 or the 3,000 who sent around, what was happening? What did he start with? Where did it come from? Where did the thousands come from? And we look at that going, oh, wow, he must be God. True. But giving is a manifestation of God's Holy Spirit. Giving is an outworking of righteousness. And I want to interplay that that righteousness is the goodness that God has placed in our hearts. And that goodness comes out of us to other people. How? In this slight instance, by giving. I want to suggest if you go back here in Romans 12, 6 to 8, it says we all have different gifts according to the grace. That is the supernatural word there. Charis, that we get charismatic. Now, there's not many charismatics that boast of the gift of or the spiritual gift of giving. There are some. But that grace, charis, comes out of God. So he says we have different gifts according to the grace that he's given. So let me just say it at this, that you're not being asked to give something that you don't have and I'm not being asked to give something that I don't have and we are not being asked to give something that we don't have. Have you got that? We're being asked to give from God. He graces us. And then he says, so if it is giving, 
then give generously. Why? Because as I said, because God gives generously, lavishly, or I'll come to another word in a moment. Giving is part of the heart of God. 316 that we all do know, for God so loved, so loved the world that he gave. And the biggest treasure that he had, think of rewards, the biggest treasure that he had is his son Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Gave his life to pay a debt, a debt, a bill that wasn't his, that was ours. So the heart of giving, even on here is the measure is that Jesus steps in and covers the debt of people who can't pay their debts and he pays it. Ultimately, in this instance, it's his life on the cross. See, I owed God my life and this is going to be really important when we talk about what I have and what do you want me to give, but isn't it mine? Is it? Let's go to Genesis. There's a bit of dust and dirt on the ground. A bunch of years, years ago, worth about $1.98 on the stock market. Bit of dirt there. And God breathed life from himself, from his spirit, from his ruach. And that life was the light of men. Or go to John and Jesus, who is the light of the world, who was the creator, the co-creator, the author of all things, and is the light or the life of all humankind. Whose are you? So when we say Jesus is Lord, I'm not talking about you make him Lord, because guess what? He already is. He owns us. And he gives us our life. He gives us us to steward and to live. Steward is like when we use it wisely. Maturity, knowledge, wisdom. Using your life wisely. He gave you a life. Breathe it in. And next time you see a baby child, that little tiny baby, and you see and you contemplate that miracle of life, that is God. He fashioned and formed and knitted us together in the mother's womb, which is why this life is so sacred. Because it's God weaving together and presents and gives us a life. He breathes into that child. So come down here. Giving is the heart of God. It is the nature and the character of God that he loved the world that he gave. And then Jesus, who represented God's heart, Gave. Giving to the poor is both our choice and our calling. Notice this is when you give to the needy. It's our call. Because God cares about, and in fact, if you look at Isaiah, Isaiah, when they announced the coming of the Messiah, of the God-man King, how does he? He blesses the poor. And the blind, Jesus stood in the synagogue and said that the Spirit is upon me and he will now bless others, that he will actually pour out and look after the poor and the orphaned and the widowed and the, the imprisoned, that he'll reach out to bless them. And then he pours the Spirit, the same Spirit that was on him, upon us and he then judges us and he says, when I was sick, you ministered to me. When I was in need, you gave to me. And they said to him, when? When did we see you hungry and we fed you? And he said, when you did to the least of these, you did it to me. Giving to the poor is not only our choice, but our calling. Here is a bit I was going to say. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7 and, and around there, he says, God promises to supply and reward giving generously. In fact, he uses this interesting word when he's talking about the church in Rome actually ministering to, uh, so I'm jumping to Romans, sorry, but yes, he uses this interesting concept when he's talking about giving to the church, the church in Rome, giving uh, to the Macedonian. Sorry, I just went blank then. <laughs> but he actually says they gave more than they physically had. So what we're saying is, they, it's like the fish in the loaves. They only started with a few and it just manifest as it were or it just multiplied 
And they gave supernaturally. So God actually promises that he will supply your need and then he actually says, press down, shaken over, and he uses these words like multiplying. He'll give us more than we need. Or the rich man might get it wrong and say, great, so I can build bigger and better barns. So I can have more? Bum, bum, missed it. Why did Jesus say, you fool, which is the opposite to wisdom, you fool, today, tonight, you will die, and who will get all of this? Because he was acting foolishly. God didn't bless so that he could store up and build bigger and better barns. He blessed, why? So that he could give. So that he could bless. So God actually chooses to bless us. Remember this, he's that two, uh, 2 Corinthians 9. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Here's that motivation. Because God loves a cheerful giver, and I love the word in the Greek for cheerful. It's the same word as your funny bone in your elbow, which draws to mind two things. Number one is it hurts when you hit it, but why do they call it a humorous? It's almost like it's ridiculous that you would call that a funny bone because it hurts. And I think like this, God loves a, a giver who hurts when they give. But also, play on words, cheerful, a joyful giver. God loves it when we take joy in blessing other people. There is one verse in Corinthians that Paul writes about Jesus that most of us know but Jesus is not recorded as saying it in Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. Does anyone know what that verse is? It is better to give than receive. That's in the Bible. Jesus is not recorded as saying it. Now John, when he writes his gospel, says, if I wrote down everything Jesus said and did, we couldn't contain those miracles and those words in all of the books, in all of the libraries, in all of the world. But Paul has obviously heard Jesus, the, the sort of reciting of Jesus. It is better to give than to receive. Let that sink in. There is something good. And let me suggest it's because of this. If we align ourselves to God's heart, we'll actually enjoy it. And I want to put that over all of these disciplines that we're going to look at over the next few weeks. We will enjoy it. Or go back to our reading. Oh, we'll finish here and then I'll go back to the reading. Here. And God, in verses 8 there, is able to bless you abundantly. So he, he can bless you abundantly. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you and I need, we will have uh, abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, and their righteousness endures forever. Now, hear those words when, when uh, Jesus says, when you practice your acts of righteousness, and we think that's just being pious, you know, and, and holy and spiritual. But look what he says here, and he attributes righteousness, scattering gifts to the poor, caring for those around about us. Now, the one who supplies the seed... I'm not asking you, God's not asking me, we're not being asked to give something that we have to, you know, comes out of us. When God supplies the seed to the sower and the bread for the food, he will also supply and increase your store of seed and you will enlarge the harvest of your, there's that word again, righteousness. And at the beginning of Matthew, I'll come well, we'll come back here, sorry. We'll come to Matthew. Beginning of Matthew, he talks about that righteousness in verse 11. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be what? Generous, ridiculous, stupidly give on every occasion. And through us, your generosity results in praise to God. Our giving to the poor, etc., lifts them up to praise him. The gifts come from him through us to them and they will praise him, not me. So it's really important we get out of the way. 
Because our goal in our blessing, in our giving lavishly, stupidly, hilariously, is that people will go, wow, God, that they will praise him. Your, this service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is overflowing to many in expressions of thanks to God, that God will be praised. Now I'm going to leave there and come back to here. Find it. Sorry, there you go. Be careful not to work out, practice, do your righteousness in front of others and be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So in other words, if you're after a bit of praise, great, have it, that's it, full stop. However, when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do. That hypocrite is that fake mask. You put it on, aren't I wonderful? Everyone see what I'm doing? I'm being righteous here. I'm giving generously. And, you've, and you're not really. You're not doing something as an act of righteousness because everything that we do in the name of God should result in praise to God. Don't be like the hypocrites in the synagogues and the streets. Notice that says church. Synagogues, just the Jewish word for churching. Don't do it like churches or people that go out in the streets and let everyone know to be honoured by others. Truly, they have again received in full their reward. So God says, if you're after a bit of praise, you're welcome to it. Do you want more though? When you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. There's this sense to which we are called. And if I said that our generosity is a bit like God's, isn't this curious? Because we often think that, you know, God wants to have his ego stroked. But he says, look, because God blesses secretly. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing so that you're giving, so that your giving will be or may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So in other words, God is not just wanting people to go like, oh, you're amazing, God. He's wanting them to be affected in the deepest part of their life. He wants this praise to well up where you're going like, thank you, because the praise and that connection is, I am loved, someone cares. God cares. I've been praying for and texting a guy. And I've mentioned this to you because I'm, and I'm saying it out loud because I'm still praying for and still messaging him. But I loved when he said, why do you care? Text with only one thumb because this one doesn't work, kids. <laughs> one thumb, slow. Because God cares. That's the answer. Because God cares. And God will reward you. In other words, God says this, I will pay you back. In fact, we've just seen God will supply not only your need, but more than you need so that you can bless. And then he says, because you gave what wasn't yours, I will give you. I will reward you. What a bonus. Do you see that loop? I'm not asking you. I'm going to give to you. I want you to pass that on and to bless, and then I'll reward you. Really? Really? And doesn't that demonstrate the heart of God? He gives us supernaturally what we didn't have so that we can give it away. And then when we give away what wasn't ours, he blesses us or rewards us. And the only catch he says is, shh. Notice when Jesus healed people a few times, he said, don't tell anybody. The reason is not just, oh, my time hasn't come because his time had come. In other words, he didn't just want people to go like, oh, you must be the son of God. That wasn't the problem. He didn't want people saying, I'll have some too. He wanted those that were being blessed to be able to enjoy the blessing and know that God loves them. And so all of his attention was addressed to the person who was receiving, not to the crowds. That is why he said, don't tell anyone. And when they did, people came crowding in on him. And in the crowd, he couldn't bless the individuals. Don't blow your trumpets. Let me focus so that people know that I love them. 
Your father who sees what he's done in secret reward. I'm going to leave this, and I meant to leave this, except to say this first part, in summary, is much like the first. Sorry, the second part is like the first. When you pray, not if, but when you pray, assuming that we will all be praying, don't be like hypocrites again, blowing a trumpet, pray standing in front of the church and others. You're allowed to pray in front of church. But you don't have to. And I loved one of our new folk came and he said on his first visit, because we asked us to pray for his dad. So you might pick who this is. But I loved what he said. And he said, I don't, I haven't prayed. Oh, actually, I did pray, but I don't know if I got it right. And I went, yes, you did. See, we measure our prayer by, you know, the elongation of our words. Thou omnipotent Father who sitteth, thy holy, and I can't even think of the other words at the moment. But, you know, big words that elaborate and fill in the blanks so that you know who I'm talking to. No, no, I don't need you to know who I'm talking to. God already hears and knows before you ask. You don't have to blow trumpets. But in this instance, they're not blowing the trumpet for God to hear. They're blowing the trumpet so everyone else says, how righteous are they? What a godly person. I'll never be like them. And you know what? I have this, here's my pride boast. I, so I'm saying, this is a genuine pride boast. I am so glad that I'm not a good prayer. I'm not even, I can say, I don't even think I'm a fantastic speaker. I can't remember words and verses. I have to ask Jock half the time. But I want people to know God, don't you? We don't need to be, you know, have all our prayers written out so we get them right. Here's my license to you. Pray wrong. You're welcome. Pray it wrong. I heard a girl stand at the front of church one time, just saved Friday night, Sunday night. She went, oh, S-H-I-T, God, you're amazing. And everyone went, can you say that? She just did. What did God hear? What did God want to her to say? He wanted her to praise, to talk to him, and she was talking to him, and he didn't have a problem. I did. She did. God didn't. Don't worry about other people. Pray to God. If you're worried about everyone else and they go, gee, they pray well, you got your reward. But when you pray, go quietly. Close the door. Pray to your Father who's unseen. And he who is unseen, who does see what is done in secret, again, real will reward you. It's the same as giving and praying. So our first lesson as it were. I think that's all I've got there. That's all I'm going to do. Our first lesson in developing those habits, those disciplines to grow up in our faith. So it's great to say, yep, I believe you, Jesus. You died on the cross for me. Thank you. You have forgiven my sin. That's great. But that's the start. And as Paul says, and I've been saying in face to face, by now you ought to be teachers. You should grow up. Or in Colossians, when we just went through the Easter services, he said, I want to present you mature. And here's the rubber. Only you can do this. So the measure of our collective church, or if you listen to that game show, the weakest link will be your prayer. So what God is calling us to do is to pray, to give. Whatever we decide, just do it. Just not when, but as you're practicing righteousness. Let the gifts of God, whatever they may be, overflow through you so that you minister. Again, in that maturity, knowledge, wisdom, knowing how to apply it, skill or ministry, so that you're able to do this well, so that people will rise up and praise God. And all I want to say is to finish, our giving and our praying comes out of the heart of God. Number one, that God is generous, and number two, that God desires a relationship. And he doesn't care how, I just want my kids to talk to me. 
and appropriately. With that humility, with that dependence, with that love, with that, God, I can't do this, can you help me? And he will bless, reward, minister to us. Let's pray. Father, and you are our dad. I want to thank you that you have provided everything we need in and through Jesus. And particularly us in this country, we don't even need to stretch our faith to be blessed. Because you constantly pour out your blessings in this nation. You've shaped us on your heart and therefore as a nation we do everything we can. Sometimes we need to do more but Father we do everything we can to make sure everyone has food. But we want them to know that you are the giver. The lavish, ridiculous, prodigal giver who not only gave his son but then gave your presence in your Holy Spirit and then said that you were working us to provide not just for us but for others that we could participate. So Lord, help us to grow up. Help us to be lavish in our praise, in our gifts and in our prayer, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. This song, uh, Robin did it just recently as an item and uh, it's a great one to introduce communion with so uh, I'm hoping you'll remember it as we start to sing it. So please stand with us and sing. Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who
please be seated. Well, this, uh, these emblems give us a very graphic picture of that John 3.16, how much God loves. Also a little bit about the rewards, because the reward ultimately is this relationship we have with God that is eternal. So the cost, or God's provision in paying that cost, was his son, ultimately. Because he had to do the two things. Number one is he had to cleanse us or forgive us and do justice for our sin, our crimes against him. And he does that in and through the cross and the body of his son Jesus, King Jesus, who is God, not just another man, not another Mel Gibson, Wallace, you know, that sort of, not that. Because the man who served us was also our creator and our God and our Lord. So he does that firstly. So whether you need for the first time or the thousandth time to be forgiven, these emblems will remind you that God has paid. So as you take the bread and break it, he's, Jesus said, this is my body. And we'll remember and you'll physically touch and hold and we're reminded of the reality of what God did in and through Jesus. And then he'll go further and say, this is my blood, a covenant which is a promise that I will forgive you, that I will wipe away. And actually the old covenant, the Old Testament, the promise was I will remove your sin as far as the east is from the west and I will not remember it. How beautiful is that? The only thing that goes on the big screen in heaven is the good things that we did in his name. None of the bad things we did against him. Wiped, forgotten. So the reality is that God dealt with that. But second is, as we take this, he says, I will be with you and I will actually empower or manifest or bless or, or give to you. I will be with you always. So he says, do this in remembrance of me. And he also says, and I'm with you. So the beauty twofold. So as you take this, you may need to pray and say, Lord, forgive me, whether that's for the first time or again. And you're reminded that our sin mattered, that the things we did cost God. But he so loved us that he gave. And then also let him be present with you and fill you. Let him bless you. Invite him even. As you take this, you open your hands to receive. You're not just getting a bit of bread and a cup but the presence of God. And he says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Ask me and I forgive you. Invite me and I will be present with you. I will sup with you. In other words, I will eat, I will fellowship, I will celebrate, I will party with you. They're God's promises to us. So let's give thanks as we take the bread. I'm going to invite you to come forward to take one of the trays back to your seat. In your time, break the bread, but physically break it and feel Jesus paying for us, my body broken. Let that hit your heart. And then I'm going to pray a second time and we're going to give thanks for the presence of God that is sort of covenanted or promised and sealed through the cup. So I'll pray. You can come forward, take this little tray back, break the bread. If you need to repent, repent. If you need to know that forgiveness, know that it's done through Jesus. And then I'll pray again and we'll take the cup. So let me pray our first time. Father, as we come and take these emblems, physically a bit of bread and a cup with juice, but they remind us of the eternity sealed through the body of Jesus on the cross that very first Easter. So as we break this bread, we confess that we have, we've lied, we've cheated, we've kept to ourselves, we've uh, thought things are just not okay, we've done things in relationship that are not okay, and yet as we confess them, we know that you are faithful to your promise and that you are just in your actions. And that through Jesus' death on the cross, we have been.
been forgiven. Speak those words over us, Father, as we break the bread, that we are forgiven. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please come forward, take a tray.